Okay, so this is the third and final of the uh, video lessons for chapter 10 on respiration. Uh, we've talked about the pathway of <coughs> respiration, how inhalation, exhalation works, the different phases of respiration, all the way down to cellular respiration, which is the whole reason why we breathe. Um, we've talked about the different parts of the respiratory system, um, differences in the lungs. We've talked about if you were to use a spirometer, which we'll be doing in class, um, the kind of graph that you would see and the different terms that they would use to talk about um, your lung capacity and different aspects of that. And respiratory efficiency, how that's a little different measure, but also really important when you talk about how healthy your lungs are. Um, then we talked about the negative feedback loops and regulation of breathing. And now we're going to talk about the transport of the gases. So um, the first slide we're going to take a look at has a lot of numbers on it. And um, these numbers are really just talking about the different pressure levels at uh, partial pressure in this case due to oxygen in different regions and KPA that stands for one type of pressure unit that's kilopascals and then this one is millimeters of mercury so really if you if you look at um, the trend of the numbers I wouldn't try memorizing them. I'm not going to expect you to be able to tell me the numbers. I just want you to notice the trend. Okay, so for the parcel pressures of oxygen, the pressure in the atmosphere due to oxygen is highest as compared to each level as you are going down in towards your tissues. Okay, so the pressure pressure in the atmosphere is higher than that in the trachea, which is higher than that in the alveoli, and higher than that in the arteries, and harder, higher than that in the extracellular fluid, which is between the arteries and the tissues. And so at each phase, because um, the pressure is lower in, the, in this next region, then the oxygen will move from the area of high pressure into the area of low pressure. So it goes from the atmosphere into the trachea, into the alveoli, into the arteries, into the extracellular fluid, and then out into the tissues. Okay, so the numbers for carbon dioxide would be the opposite. So they'd be the highest in the tissue and the lowest in the atmosphere. And this is just describing that down at the bottom. Okay, so you could even <coughs> have written mathematically the, that the PO2 is greater or PO2 of the atmosphere is greater than the PO2 of the trachea greater than PO2 of the alveoli which is greater than and so on to, so, to show why oxygen moves from the atmosphere down into your tissues. Okay, there's an, an animation that's linked from the class notes page and I'll also link it for Medmoto. Um, it's a good to uh, it's a little more complex, and it shows both gases moving at the same time. Um, but it does show these kind of uh, broken up into sections. So it would show <coughs> the movement from the atmosphere into the alveoli of oxygen, but it also shows the numbers for carbon dioxide to show why it moves out of the alveoli into the atmosphere. Okay, so these are just to remind you Again, you don't have to know the numbers, but that the partial pressure is highest in the atmosphere, lower in the alveoli, lower in the vessels, lower again in the extracellular fluid, but lowest in the tissues, in your cells. Okay, so it moves from the atmosphere into your cells, and then this is showing the opposite. It's highest in, for partial pressure due to carbon dioxide, it's highest in the cells, and lowest as you go out into the atmosphere. Now, how does it get carried around in the blood? Um, for oxygen, it gets carried by hemoglobin. So 
it's important to kind of explain how much hemoglobin helps. Without hemoglobin, only about 0.3 mils of oxygen would be dissolved per 100 mils of blood. And we really need about 10 times that when we're at rest alone. So if you can imagine when you're really busy and active, you need that much more oxygen to get to your tissues, we need really rely on hemoglobin. Without hemoglobin, oh sorry, with hemoglobin, 20 mils will dissolve per 100 mils, so that's like 70 times as much. Um, because the hemoglobin picks up the oxygen that's been floating around in the blood plasma, it means that there's more space then in the plasma to pick up or carry oxygen. So more can be carried from the lungs to the tissues just floating around in the plasma. When oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, we call it oxyhemoglobin, which kind of makes sense. Um, it has a strong bonding with oxygen, so very little of it will be released until it reaches the capillaries where there's a bigger pressure difference. Okay, so here in the capillaries, remember the pressure at the arterial end is high, and so it forces the oxygen and nutrients out into the tissues where the pressure due to oxygen is lower. So this is what hemoglobin looks like, and we did a very simple diagram, and I will um, try and take a picture of one and put it up on a photo for you, but you should be able to sketch and tell me what the parts are. Okay, so obviously this is much more complicated than the little sketch that we've done, um, but the four different colors are showing four large um, protein chains that make up the great big protein. Okay, so there's four protein chains. Okay, there's two alpha and two beta, but you don't have to know that much. Uh, within each, there is what we call a heme group. So these little gray things with the red thing in the middle, those are representing the heme groups. And the hemoglobin is found inside of a blood cell. That, so that's what, sorry, a red blood cell. That's what makes it red, and that's the job of the red blood cells is to carry oxygen, right? So, again, each hemoglobin molecule is made up of four protein chains, and each protein chain has a heme group in the middle. And the heme group in the middle, this is its structure down here on the lower left. I don't expect you to be able to draw that, okay? But you should really make note of what's in the middle. Okay, so the red thing that they're showing over here, and the red Fe in the middle, that stands for iron. So that's why it's really important that you get enough iron in your diet, because if you don't get enough iron, then the hemoglobin is not going to work, even if it's made, because it has to have the iron there to bind the oxygen. So if you don't have enough iron, or you don't have enough hemoglobin, or you don't have enough red blood cells, then your body would not be getting enough oxygen to the tissues, and you'd be considered what we call anemic. Okay, you'd be probably pretty pale and lethargic, not having much energy. Okay, but it's the iron that's at the center of the heme group where the oxygen can attach. Okay, so the oxygen attaches to the heme group. So since there are four heme groups, each, ox or each hemoglobin has the ability to carry four oxygen molecules. Now, carbon dioxide transport is a little more complicated. Um, of what we produce, 9% is carried floating around in the blood plasma. And that's more soluble than oxygen. There's a lot more carbon dioxide that can be carried that way. But that's still only 9%. Almost a third combines with hemoglobin. And when carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin, we call it carbamino hemoglobin. Okay, so it kind of starts the same as carbon dioxide, but carbamino hemoglobin. The most of the carbon dioxide is carried in a different form though. So what happens is 
when the carbon dioxide goes out into the blood, the blood is mostly water, remember the blood plasma is mostly water, it forms H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. And if you remember from chemistry class, acids are called acids because when they are dissolved in water, they dissociate, they break apart in other words, and they give hydrogen ions and then another ion. So the formation of carbonic acid is um, catalyzed by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. So that's an important enzyme to know about. Um, and w it's really important that we can convert this carbon dioxide because by fixing it into another molecule or kind of converting it to something else, it leaves room out in the blood plasma for more carbon, di carbon dioxide to come out. Okay, so that's what this is saying down here. It decreases the, car the amount of carbon dioxide that's kind of floating there as carbon dioxide in the blood. And so because there's less of it there, then the pressure difference will be maintained and more of it can come out of the tissues. So we get it out of the tissues into the blood. Now I'm going to show you a picture in a minute which might help you to visualize this a little better. Okay, so we said, oh, this carbonic acid is called an acid because in water it's going to dissociate. It's unstable, it dissociates into hydrogen ions, which makes things acidic. Okay, the more that are there, the more acidic things are. Um, and this is bicarbonate ion. So the carbon dioxide floats around most of it, 64%, as bicarbonate ion. So it'll float in the blood as that. But the problem is, if we left these hydrogen ions just floating as they are, then it would make the blood really acidic. It would make the pH go lower because there's more hydrogen ions there. So the hydrogen ions help actually to bump oxygen off hemoglobin and they jump on. So hemoglobin acts as what we call a buffer. It will bind the hydrogen ions and it makes there be less hydrogen ions in the blood. Okay, so it keeps the pH up to where it should be and keeps it being not as acidic. So, then what happens? The hemoglobin with the hydrogen ions on it is going to float back to the lungs, okay, with some bicarbonate ions. And when we get back to the lungs, the opposite is going to happen. Oxygen is going to hop onto the hemoglobin and the hydrogen ions are going to bind with bicarbonate to form carbon dioxide again and water. The carbon dioxide we breathe out. Okay, so it sounds kind of complicated. So This is a little simplistic picture to help you. So the carbon dioxide goes out into your blood. When it gets there, there's a whole lot of water, so it reacts with the water to form carbonic acid, and that's catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase. Okay, but this is unstable, so it quickly dissociates or breaks apart into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions, and the bicarbonate ions are going to float around, okay, they're going to float around in um, the blood so 64% of the carbon dioxide floats around in this form. The hydrogen ions bump off the oxygen and they hop onto hemoglobin. Okay, so that there's not too many of them out there and making the blood acidic, the hemoglobin picks them up and oxygen will be able to go out into the tissues. So, <coughs> it helps to make sure that the oxygen is bumped off. So here's an even more detailed picture. So this is what we just showed. Carbon dioxide, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high in the tissues, so it's going to go out into the blood. So the carbon dioxide reacts with the water, we get carbonic acid, which is unstable, so it dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is going to float around, and the hydrogen ions are going to jump onto hemoglobin and they will go back to the lungs. So this is showing out at the lungs. 
So back at the lungs, oxygen is going to bump off the hydrogen ions, and the hydrogen ion is going to react with the bicarbonate in order to get carbonic acid again, and the whole reverse thing is going to happen. So we get carbon dioxide and water. And since the partial pressure is lower out in the alveoli, the carbon dioxide is going to go out into the lungs so that we can breathe it out. Okay, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is lower in the alveoli and even lower out in the atmosphere, so we breathe it out. In the meanwhile, the hemoglobin is going to carry oxygen, go back out to the tissues, and the same thing is going to happen over again. So hopefully that helped make it a little uh, easier to understand. I think there's another picture that just shows the same thing. These are some of the conditions that you need to know about, and some of them we're covering through case studies. Again, they're more for recognition in match questions, or multiple choice, or the odd fill in the blank. <coughs> but they're more common ones that you might hear people talk about, and it's good for you to understand them. If you do have any questions or need me to go over anything else, I'd gladly help you. Just let me know. These are some other questions, so you should have this slide. Um, especially focus on the ones about lung cancer. Uh, the others are more for review on your own. Okay, so if you do have questions, please let me know. I'd love to help.